from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Steve Levingston, nonfiction editor of the Washington Post, which is a charter sponsor of the National Book Festival. Back in August 2010, the world was transfixed by a drama unfolding in northern Chile. 33 miners had become trapped under tons of rock after their mine collapsed. And there they remained for 69 days in tenuous conditions as rescuers worked to free them. It was a remarkable story of potential disaster, endurance, and ultimately survival. The miners agreed to tell their story to only one person, and that person is our guest today, Hector Tobar. Hector conducted hundreds of hours of interviews with all 33 miners. He climbed into the mine, he walked the town to absorb the landscape. While conducting the interviews, he became the miners' therapist, or as he put it, their, their confessor priest. Speaking to Hector became a kind of catharsis for them, and gradually he teased out a rich, horrifying story, which became his book, Deep Down Dark. Hector's haunting narrative was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. The Washington Post called it a chiseled, brooding book. Our reviewer wrote that Tobar describes this ordeal as if he were down there in the, with the miners, seeing as little as they do, recording the events through the dim echo of voices. Novelist Anne Patchett describes the book as a masterpiece of compassion. Hector Tobar brought a novelist's eye to Deep Down Dark, for he is also a novelist. He is also a former, former foreign correspondent and national reporter for his hometown newspaper, the Los Angeles Times. And he was part of the reporting team that won the 1993 Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the Los Angeles riots. So please join me in welcoming Hector Tobar. Um, thank you so much um, to all of you for coming out to the book festival. Um, we writers depend on you, readers, and thank you for what you're doing for literary culture by buying books and reading them and talking to your friends and family about them. Uh, as a writer, I deeply appreciate that. I also want to thank um, the National Book Festival for this invitation. It's the first time I've been invited to the National Book Festival. And since I am from a family that has illiteracy in its past, my grandmother was a Guatemalan uh, Mayan uh, uh, servant who did not know how to read and write, never learned how to read and write. And for her grandson, who became a writer, this is a truly great honor. So thank you to everyone who organizes this event. Um, I, uh, this is the great, this book about uh, Chilean miners is the great um, journalistic project of my life. I write both nonfiction and fiction, and this book sort of fell to me, and, um, and it really is something that I have felt so honored to write, but I want to tell you a little bit at the beginning here of my talk uh, how it was that I came to write this. Many of you have read the book and know that a little bit about how the book came together. Um, but I did not actually watch this happen in person. I watched this event, this, these 33 men trapped underground, much in the same way I think most of you did. I saw this on television. Um, I remember hearing uh, in uh, mid, the middle of August that these men had been found underground and then that, that they might actually be trapped until Christmas. And I remember thinking, wow, that's, that's going to be quite, quite a thing to endure. Uh, but I had no idea uh, that I would be the person who could write their book. And uh, until I was sitting in a cafe uh, in South Pasadena, California, where I was working on the revisions to my novel, uh, The Barbarian Nurseries, uh, when I got a phone call from my agent. And if you're an LA writer, especially anytime your agent calls from New York, it's kind of a big deal. Um, because we're used to sort of being, you know, way out there on the coast. And, um, and so he said, Hector, had, would you be interested in writing the story of the Chilean miners? And my first question, very practical, I said, well, uh, do you have their rights? And, I, and my agent said, yes. And I said, well, how many? And he said, all of them. And I wondered how that could be. How could it be that all 33 of these guys had together signed a contract with William Morris Endeavor, my agency? And it turned out 
that when these men were still trapped, um, they're, remember, they are um, trapped 2,100 feet underground, more than 100 stories underground in this mountain. It's made of this hard diorite stone, and it has this highway that goes down into it that it takes, like, it's about four or five miles long, this highway, because it's at a 10% grade. They're trapped at the bottom of this, and they um, are trapped initially for 17 days. No one knows if they're alive. And then they're found, and it's this moment of worldwide uh, celebration, especially in Chile. It's a huge moment of, of joy. Uh, they spend 52 more days trapped underground. And while they were trapped underground for those second 52 days, um, a tube had broken down to them, and they got food that way, and they got fresh water. They also got mail from their loved ones. Um, a fiber optic link came down to them. Uh, the Chilean government got from Samsung a television that's not much bigger than this bottle of water that actually um, broadcast, it, it, it shoots a projection of a television image so the men were watching television, and they could see that they, these guys who worked in this really lousy mine with horrible working conditions, they were sort of like the third tier mining job guys, you know, these guys had realized that they had become the most famous miners on earth. And so some of them were getting letters from their wives or girlfriends, and sometimes from both, um, <laughs> saying, honey, uh, Italian television wants to pay to send us to Milan to do an interview. Or, honey, they heard you were jogging in the mine and a certain shoe company wants to give you a contract if you wear their tennis shoes when you come out. And, and so the men realized that some of them were going to make a lot of money off of this. And it didn't quite seem fair that just a few make money. And so the very last day that they're trapped, and they're, remember, they're going to come out in a capsule. Uh, a second hole is, is, is um, drilled down. And it's roughly the diameter of this podium. So they're going to squeeze into it and come out. And just before that final journey that they're going to take, one at a time, they have one final meeting, all 33 of them. They say, look, we suffered together. We got through this because we were united. We need to stick together and sell our story as one. It's the only fair thing to do. Now, there are some discussions about this. Some men disagree. They say, look, I need to provide for my family. I am the provider. I have to make sure that my family has something. Others say, no, we have to stick together. They vote on it. Uh, the majority prevails. Um, so all 33 men agree to stick together. Um, in fact, they even try to have a contract signed while they're still trapped. So they call to the surface because they have this phone and they ask the psychologist they're talking to, who is the person they talk to most often, and they say, uh, Dr. Pinilla, can you get a notary out here? <laughs> and so the notary drives out to the mine. He talks to the men on a fiber optic you know, video conference link. He sees them on a screen, much like the screen that I'm on over there, you know, that, that kind of screen. And he says, senores, I would love to uh, notarize any document uh, that you guys want me to have signed. Unfortunately, um, I cannot do it while you're trapped 2,000 feet underground. And so they agree to stick together. And when they get out, after a few days of, uh, in the hospital to get checked out, um, they start making contacts with lawyers. And they contact the biggest law firm in Chile. And this law firm, uh, Carey & Associates, is located in Santiago in uh, a new sort of booming part of Santiago, beautiful new South American capital city that's had this amazing growth. And it's, they're in the tallest tower in Santiago. And in this part of Santiago, there's so many new towers, it's called San Hatton, right? <laughs> And so these men and who were buried in this mine that is almost as deep, you know, 100 stories deep, go to the tallest building in Chile. And in this conference room with a view of the Andes, they sign this agreement and, um, and they uh, agree to hire uh, a single writer, make a single movie. Um, as a result of that, they call William Morris Endeavor, and they say, well, who do you have? Uh, William Morris Endeavor thinks they have a meeting. Who could we get to write this book? Well, we need someone who speaks Spanish, 
uh, someone who's a journalist, um, someone who has written a novel because there's been some other books that have come out that are not very good and so we need something more literary, someone who knows South America. Well, in terms of writers in English, that description is me and two other people. <laughs> and one of them is Daniela Arcon, who is in another room over there someplace, and I am represented by William Morris Endeavor, and my agent was at the meeting. And so, and so that's how I ended up getting this call from my agent. And so I said yes, I jumped at the opportunity, and I flew down to Copiapó uh, in northern Chile. And Copiapó is um, a booming mining town of about 150,000 people, lots of new buildings, but also a very old town in its center. And it's surrounded by this magical, desolate desert, which is famous for being the most, the driest desert on earth. It rains once every 12 or 13 years. There's a deluge in Copiapó that causes a big flood, but usually it's very, very dry. Um, and so I fly out there and I go to a restaurant where the lawyers have gotten together, uh, 25 or so of the 33 miners. Uh, those of you who read the book know they're scattered all over Chile, but the majority live in the north, so I meet 25 or so of them. The lawyers um, are already having a lot of problems sort of keeping these guys united, and so they have this meeting, and they say, uh, Senores, we have now hired a writer. Here he is, Mr. Hector Tobar, ganador del Premio Pulitzer, Pulitzer Prize winner. You know, please, uh, please, here he is. And so they hustle me up on, on a little platform in this restaurant above these guys looking up at me, and I tell them, you guys have lived um, an adventure story that, uh, that people are going to be talking about a thousand years. You guys have lived the odyssey of our times, I told them, the odyssey of the 21st century. And my job is to write this in a way that people talk about it for a thousand years. Um, everyone saw this story unfold, everyone knows about it. My job is to tell the true story in the same way that we read today about Ulysses coming back from the Trojan War. So you guys have lived the Odyssey and my job is to be your Homer. <laughs> and the result of that was a lot of blank stares. <laughs> um, and so I, I, um, but I, I ran after I finished, one of the uh, lawyer's assistants comes up and she says, Mr. Tobar, he's here in his first trip to Chile. Uh, he's going to be here in Copiapó for uh, f four days or so. Please, anyone who wants to be interviewed by him, uh, please sign up. Here's a sign up sheet right here. Whoever wants to sign in, please line up. And so they start to line up and, uh, and they sign up for these interviews and um, we begin to organize them. But I did my very first interview right there in the restaurant. And so I said, well, you know, I, I really want to talk alone to, 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 to this, uh, to, to Richard was the first one. He wanted to talk to me first because he had to take a bus back to his town. Uh, his, he lived outside of Copiapó, it was several hours bus journey, so he wanted to talk to me first. And so we made a little uh, space uh, in the restaurant, a quiet place, and he began to talk to me. And my questions first were, how did you get into mining? And what was mining life like? Tell me about your family. And so Richard told me that when he was trapped down below uh, in the dark, 2,000 feet below ground, he was undergoing this emotional crisis. It was an emotional crisis for him because his girlfriend was pregnant with their first child. So he was about to become a father. And Richard remembered how when he was a kid, when he was an adolescent, his father had died in an accident. Uh, his father was a fisherman and he had died in a lake. Uh, a lightning bolt or something had struck the boat and caused um, his father to drown uh, in the middle of this lake. And Richard had grown up for the rest of his life and his young adult life without a father. And he said, you know, that made me really angry and hurt. And I was even in jail briefly, you know, because I get into fights and I was just a really angry kid. And so when I was trapped, he told me, I started thinking, oh my God, my, I'm leaving the same thing to my son. My son isn't going to know me. And this ate Richard up while he was trapped. And I discovered right away that this was going to be a common theme in my interviews with the men. It was that in being trapped, they were separated from the people who loved them and they had to reflect on how they led their lives, the pain they were going to leave behind. For some, 
the pain they'd already inflicted on people in their lives? Was this some sort of divine judgment um, for others? What, how is my wife going to get through the rest of her life without me? And, and so this, I, this theme of family kept coming up again and again. And as I talk more to Richard, he began to tremble. And he was telling me that he was having nightmares, that he couldn't sleep well. Um, and I, after a while, I said, well, Richard, are you seeing anybody uh, to talk about this? Because I have been in Iraq and other situations as a reporter where I've been in the presence of death. I've had loss in my family. I know that sometimes you need to talk to someone. And he said, well, I was seeing a psychologist but the psychologist told me, nah, you're fine, go home. And, I, and Richard told me, but I told the psychologist, no, I'm not fine. Ask my wife, she will tell you what I was like before. And this came up again and again, that these men were suffering, many of them, not all of them, many of them were suffering from a very recognizable trauma, uh, the trauma of having faced death and of having gone through a violent event. And I want to read to you just a short, a couple of very short passages from my book that describe exactly what these men uh, went through. Um, in this particular passage, um, there's a space down below uh, where the men run to. It's called the refuge. And it's basically as big as your average sort of, let's say, high school classroom. And it's a space that is reinforced barely with some like wire mesh to keep the rock the stone walls from collapsing on the men. And so um, it also has a steel door, and they run into this refuge. And then when, because the, the mountain collapses, it's like an earthquake underground. It's like living through an avalanche underground. So the men who were at the refuge tried to escape twice on foot during lulls in the explosion. So there is a ramp that goes down, and they try running back up this ramp to get away. After a first attempt ends with a retreat back to the refuge, they try again, only to find the rumbling of an underground earthquake beginning anew. The solid rock of the mountain is transformed into a breathing, pulsating mass. The ceiling and floor of the ramp become undulating waves of stone, and the mountain hurls boulders that emerge from the blackness of the tunnels and roll and bounce downhill, each a lethal weapon aimed at their bodies. We were a pack of sheep, and the mountain was about to eat us, one of the miners later says. For the miner Victor Samora, the sound of exploding rock feels like machine gun fire aimed at him and his fellow miners. It's too much, too scary, too dangerous. So they start running back downhill, but it's as if they were running on a bridge swaying in the wind, one of the miners says. The supervisors, Luis Arzu and Florencio Avalos, arrive at this moment in a pickup truck, and they see this panicked group of men running toward them. They watch, mesmerized, as another blast wave rushes through the tunnel. It seems to pick up Alex Vega, the smallest and slightest of the miners, and it lifts him off his feet as if he were some miner-shaped kite that caught a sudden gust of wind. Others are knocked over, falling, flailing in the air. They stumble, these big men in overalls, men with bodies shaped by red wine and beer and backyard barbecues, babied by their wives and mothers and mothers-in-law. The blast knocks Samora against the wall of the ramp, face first, knocking out some of the teeth he was born with and a few that a dentist made for him, adding a sharper pain to the already dull, lingering pain of a rotting molar. When he and the others see the supervisor's pickup truck, they rise to their feet and rush toward it. Zamora squeezes his dust-covered body and bloody mouth into the narrow seat behind the driver, and they drive toward the surface. So when they drive toward the surface, they go back up this ramp. It's a 10% grade, and they, it's cloudy and dusty, and suddenly they can, they, they, all these rocks are blocking the path, so they have to get out and get on foot. And they walk on foot, and they see uh, like a, a, a wall, and they shine a flashlight on it, but it's too dusty, and so they wait for the dust to settle. And an hour later, they try again, and they see that this ramp, this tunnel, suddenly has a brand new wall blocking the way. 
And one of the miners told me it was um, like the stone they put in front of Jesus' tomb. And another miner told me it was like a guillotine of stone. And they realized that there's no way out. And so they start trying to find a way out. Um, some of them climb up these tunnels. They go up through this particular, it's about three meter wide uh, air shaft. Um, and they climb up through it to get to the next level of the ramp because the ramp is like a spiral. And they get to the next level and they start trying to walk up and the same wall is blocking the way out. And they realize that a huge chunk of the mine has broken free. In fact, it's as tall, this particular rock, as a 45-story building the Chilean government will later um, establish. And so um, they begin to uh, take stock of what, uh, what they have, where they are. Meanwhile, another group of men goes down to the refuge where they have these emergency supplies and they're hungry. It's the end of the day. The accident happened at one in the afternoon in between trying to get out and, you know, trying to find out where they are. It's now evening. They're used to having their wives prepare a big supper for them. And so they have these emergency supplies. And one of the men says, I'm hungry. I want to eat. Another miner says, no, we have to wait. We don't know how long we're going to be in here. There's a confrontation. Uh, eventually, one of the miners agrees in the face of these hungry men to open the cabinet, and a few men uh, break in and steal the emergency supplies. Now, this was a secret that the men kept for the three years that I worked on this book. For three years, they told nobody uh, that this had happened. Um, and it turned out there were many secrets that they kept. Another secret that only uh, barely made it out into the Chilean media was how deeply divided they were, uh, especially uh, in that first day, and how the man who was supposed to be the leader underground, uh, Luis Ursua, who wears a white helmet as the symbol of his authority, uh, sort of like a white collar. He has a white helmet. The other men have red helmets and yellow helmets and blue helmets. He has a white helmet that indicates he's a supervisor. The first night he says, this is too much for me. I take off my white helmet. We're all equal. Now, some people see that as a way of him accepting the fact that they need, they need to pull together. Others see this as a betrayal. They believe that it's like the captain of a ship when the ship is sinking saying, I'm no longer the captain, it's all every man for himself. And in fact, the situation could have very quickly deteriorated into chaos, into something like the Lord of the Flies, but for the presence of two or three uh, men who um, saw that someone needed to speak, someone needed to take the initiative, and they needed to be leaders. And one of them was a man who was very low on the totem pole in the mine. He operated a front loader. His name is Mario Sepulveda. And in the movie that comes out on November 13th, he is going to be played by Antonio Banderas. <laughs> and Mario emerges as a leader because he has been a fighter all of his life. And he sees things falling apart, and he believes he needs to fight to survive. His nickname is Perry. Now, this had appeared in a previous book about uh, the miners, um, and it had, uh, the writer, who was a BBC reporter, said that he, uh, he was called Perry because he was the, later became the spokesperson, and Perry was short for periodista, which means journalist. And that turned out not to be true, because when I interviewed Mario, I asked him, Mario, why do they call you Perry? And he goes, well, it's because I love dogs. And in Chile, Perry is a short way of saying perrito, which means little dog. So he was a dog, and he said, in fact, Mario was someone who uh, loves life, uh, educated through grade school, but extremely articulate and intelligent, and a lover of life. He told me, uh, I love dogs. I have the heart of a dog. Tengo corazón de perro. And in fact, he told me, and he, he is someone who has moments of when he sort of um, becomes a little bit manic. And he said, look, when I got my wife pregnant, the first, it was the first time we did it, and we were standing up against a post in the barrio. <laughs> and in that vein, you know, I'm like, a, I am a dog, I'm loyal. <laughs> but if you betray me, I'll bite you. And so Mario becomes 
one of the men who is the most uh, important leader. He is having very wide mood swings. He is optimistic. He is unifying at one moment, and the next he gets very depressed. It doesn't seem fair to him. It's like, not fair that I am going to die here. He tells him, you know, my, my mother died delivering me. And he, like Richard and like many other miners, has these stories of um, loss, these stories of, um, of extreme poverty. And so he says, this isn't fair, th that I am going to suffer this. He, um, but he manages to keep the men together when they pray. He's the first one to tell them they should pray. He tells uh, an evangelical miner, a miner who's an evangelical uh, Christian, please lead us in prayer. Um, and he's the one, Mario is the one who, who divides the food up and serves the food every day. For the first 17 days, they're trapped. Um, and, and so I, I began to enter this world of the miners uh, in these interviews. I learned about Mario. I learned about uh, these men, where they were from. Uh, not all my interviews were great interviews. I interviewed all 33 miners. Usually, I tried to get them in their homes. Sometimes, a few of them would not uh, grant me uh, an individual interview. That I'd interview them in a group of two or three men. Um, but as I was doing these interviews, um, sometimes I'd go to a miner's house and he really wouldn't have that, that much to say, but I would be in his home with his wife or his girlfriend, and she would step forward and begin to tell me these stories of what was happening on the surface. And I realized that there was this incredibly important family story that was part of this saga. And so that is also in the book. It's the story of this community of, mo of women mostly, led by women, that was formed on the surface to, um, force the government to complete the rescue, to get the men out alive as quickly as possible. And um, it was a place, too, this community, where some of the divisions in the men's family played out because many of them had been divorced or not divorced because divorce wasn't legal in Chile until 2005. But many of them had two families, you know. They had uh, children from a previous relationship. And so all of these families got sort of mixed up on the surface. But I began hearing about one woman in particular who um, uh, everyone was clear to me it was, it, she was very important. They called her La Alcaldesa, the mayor. And so I said, well, I need to meet La Alcaldesa. And it turned out to be the sister of one of the miners. And she is a 54-year-old great-grandmother um, from a very poor family. Uh, she uh, was part of a large family of seven or eight siblings. And she was one of the older siblings. So she took care of the younger siblings. And so now, even though they're in their 50s, she still looks after her brother. So she comes down to the mine and begins to organize the families. Um, she is someone who sells um, empanadas, uh, bakes these baked treats, you know, uh, uh, desserts uh, on by the beach. She is about four foot ten, uh, very dark skinned, especially from being out in the sun, you know, for so many years. So in the movie, she's going to be played by Juliette Binoche. <laughs> <laughs> And Juliet is a wonderful job. And, uh, and the movie I highly recommend, too. It's, it's a wonderful film. And, uh, but Juliet Binoche plays Maria Segovia. And so Maria tells me, among many things that she tells me, when the men are finally going to come out in this capsule, and she's, you know, she's, she, she stays there at the camp so long, all the time, she gets on a first-name basis with the president and with the minister of mining, this woman who sells empanadas, and they're going to come out through this capsule that, as I said, is about as wide as this podium. And she says, you know, we were really scared when the first guy, when the, when the men began to come out because it was like, you know, they were coming through this tube and it was like the mine was a woman and it was going to give birth to them, you know? <laughs> and you know, and she knows because she's a great grandmother and as many of you in this room know that childbirth, you know, is a complicated thing. And child, in, a chi in childbirth, uh, a, a baby can get stuck. And so that was a fear. These men will get stuck in this, in this um, uh, stone channel. The mountain is still stable. It's still thundering. There's a chance they might get stuck. And, it, and Maria wasn't the only one who brought up this metaphor to me. Um, she's uh, another woman. In fact, Darío's uh, uh, girlfriend, wife, common-law wife, she's waiting on the surface for him. And she says that when Darío came out, and Darío is about 50 years old, white hair, grizzled skin, it was like 
When he came out, it was like he was a baby, and I wanted to touch him to make sure he was whole. Because that's what a mom does when a baby comes out. You touch the baby. You want to see that he's all there, that she's all there. And so she touched him um, at, to see that he was all there. And even the miners themselves, Florencio Avalos, who was the first miner out, and Alex Vega, who came out later, they both told me that when they came through this this uh, cavity when they were being lifted up to the surface, uh, squeezed in like this. They said, uh, I saw my whole life flash before me. I saw all, I remembered all the things that happened in the mine because it took like 40 minutes to raise them to the surface. I remembered things that happened in the mine. I remembered when we divided the food. I remember when we prayed. I remember when I met my wife. I remember when my kids were born. And so this whole idea of resurrection was a really powerful uh, notion among, among these men. And that ended up becoming the central theme of the book. It's a story about family. It's a story about the things that bind us together. Because when these men were trapped underground and the time that they were waiting uh, to get rescued or when they thought they might not be rescued at all, what did they think about? They didn't think about how much money they had made. They didn't think about the property they owned, the cars they owned. They thought about the people who loved them and the people they had loved, the love they had brought into the world. Because they knew that was the most important and the best thing of their lives. And in the end, after they're pulled out, they become famous. They go to Disney World where they make them wear minor helmets with rabbit with mouse ears <laughs> sticking out. And they have these moments of flashback, these moments of sorrow, these moments of weakness, these moments of, of weakness in the sense of just feeling small before their nightmares and the terror they're carrying. They rely on their families to heal them. And in the end, that's what heals them. It's family routine, family love. It's the meal on the table every day. And, uh, and to me, that was the, the, the central message I took from the book, was how important family life is in the lives of all of us, uh, uh, in, in the lives of these ordinary men who survive thanks to the ordinary things that they possessed. Um, and um, it's been a wonderful journey, the three or four years I've spent on this book. I hope that you have a chance to read it and see the film called The 33 in November. And with that, I will take your questions. Thank you very much. There are microphones here at the front. Please, please, if someone has questions to ask. Yes? Yes, I read the book. Excellent. I felt like I was down in the mine with the miners. My question is, you talked to, of course, all 33. Where were the most consistencies and where were the most differences? I think there were the most consistencies in describing the first 17 days they were trapped. So for the first 17 days, um, they're trapped in the dark. Their lamps get dimmer and dimmer uh, until they find a way to set up a light. One of the miners is an electrician. He takes a, a filament from a car that's trapped down there with them, uh, links it to some batteries, and actually makes a light come out. So th those first 17 days, there was a, a sense that we were united. It was pure. We prayed every day. The, the prayer sessions that the men had followed their meal. They would eat, and then they would pray. They would confess um, transgressions to each other. They would apologize for transgressions. And so it became this religious event. And so there was absolute unity among them in telling that story. The person who had stolen the food, accepted responsibility for it, told me why he had done it. So there was, you know, an honesty among them. He, before they were found, when they were close to dying of hunger, the man who led the raid on the food apologized to the men. He said, I am so sorry. I didn't know what I was doing that would hurt. I see you guys starving now. They had lost 20, 30 pounds in the time they were not eating. He felt terrible. And so there's a, there's a definite unity in the telling of that story. Now, when they're found and they uh, realize they become famous and they're waiting to be rescued, that's when the divisions begin. And that's when you have the evangelicals and the Catholics start fighting about, over things. The Pope sends some rosaries. The Catholics are very happy. The evangelicals say, I don't want to see that. You know, the, the Catholics pray to the Virgin and to certain saints, and the evangelicals say, thou shalt not pray to, you know, uh, go to images. And so there's lots of divisions and lots of arguments. 
the, they get the newspapers down and the newspapers say that Mario's the leader and Mario tells the press, I am the absolute leader. And so the, a lot of the men get very offended by that, by reading that in the newspaper while they're still trapped. I thought we were all together in this, et cetera, et cetera. So in that, there was many, many divisions. Um, there were a lot of divisions too in what happened afterwards um, in terms of who, who really was the leader. Was Luis Rosua really the leader? Many men were very upset that he was being celebrated as a leader. So that's when a lot of the divisions, uh, differences in the stories were, yes, is it? Yes, thank you. Next question. Um, have you seen the movie yet? And if so, is it good? <laughs> thank you very much for that question. I have seen the movie. I saw a screening of it. Um, the, most, uh, the most important thing uh, uh, to me is um, that it's true to the emotional center of the story. In other words, it's a dramatization of, of the events that are in the book. Um, they have composite characters. So there's 33 guys, right? So you, it's really hard to have 33 guys in a movie because then you would have 33 actors fighting for attention. And that would be even worse than being trapped in a mine for the director. <laughs> and so, and so there's a, a very strong lead, Antonio Banderas, who plays Mario. Mm -hmm. And Antonio does a wonderful, wonderful job. I really, I just, I, I can't tell you, he is the reason the movie is a success. Um, uh, it doesn't quite end where my book ends, but all 33 of the real miners are in the movie at one moment. I won't tell you when and where, but, uh, but I really liked it, and I really encourage people to see it. And there will be another, this is my version of my book in paperback, but there will be another one that has Antonio Banderas in the cover. <laughs> so thank you for a great question. Thank you. Right. Yes, over here. Hello. I started your book two days ago oh. and did not know you were going to be here. So this is a very minor point, but it has, it has puzzled me. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what you make of the vision just before uh, the, the rock falls into place of maybe the butterfly. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, for those of you who haven't read the book, uh, these two older guys are driving this truck down into the ramp. They're going down into the mine. When, uh, and just before the mine begins to collapse behind them, right? Because the ramp is going down and this big rock is going to collapse behind them. Uh, there is a moment where a white rock or a butterfly flutters in front of, um, uh, in front of the window of the, of the truck. And so I had heard this story. It had become like a myth almost. In fact, there was a very uh, quickly done, uh, I'm told not very good movie done in Spain where one of the miners follows the butterfly to safety, you know? So it was like, so then I had the two guys before me, you know? It's like, and so right in front of me, they had the same discussion they had in the truck, where the driver of the truck, Franklin Lobos, who is a retired soccer star, uh, you know, down on his luck, he says, it was a white rock. And I told it to him at the moment. I said, it was a white rock. And Jorge Gallego says, no one will ever be able to convince me otherwise. It was a butterfly. So at the moment, they're 2,000 or 1,700 feet underground. So the idea that there would be a butterfly is a little bit hard to swallow. Um, and later I was like being shown a, um, a pile of ore from the mine, you know, a pile of, of extracted ore. And in this extracted ore, there was like, you know, copper flex, beautiful stuff. But there was also lots of white quartz. So that mine, part of what was in the mine was a lot of white quartz. So to me, it's more than likely that it really was a piece of white quartz. Um, but, uh, but that, that sort of, those two versions of that story are in the book. So thank you for asking. Yes. Where do I go next here? Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm wondering if in your interviews, it, a sense came out that the miners recognized that in so many of these cases, uh, whether it's in West Virginia or at the Coahuila disaster in 2006 in Mexico, that there's usually not a happy ending. Yes. Uh, with these mine disasters. Yes. And they had any thoughts about that or any thoughts about how remarkable it was, the sort of unified efforts with civil society and government and even a lot of international actors that sort of made this one in a million chance of rescuing the miners happen? Well, definitely the men are aware of how lucky they were. In fact, when we were discussing the title of the book, my editor suggested we insert the word miracle into this uh, subtitle. And I said, 
you know, that's fine with me because I've been talking to those men for three years and that's the way they see it. They see it as this miracle. And even in the figurative sense of just that all these men came together or men and women came together to rescue them. Um, there was that. Um, uh, the first part of your question was about, um, I'm sorry, I just remembered something else I wanted to say. So, so there's this recognition that it was um, very, and yes, they, many of them uh, believed that they were going to die down there. In fact, the older miners told me, you know, um, they saw this rock and they said, cagamos, which is a Chilean way of saying we're screwed. You know, we're screwed. We're not going to get out of here. And, they, and many of them, the last days that they were before the drill broke through, because then they hear these drills coming towards them, but they kept on missing. They kept on going past them, the refuge where they were, and going further down into the mine and not, not breaking through. In the very last days before, that, before the, mine, the drill finally broke through, the men were beginning to write their farewell letters. And this is a very poignant scene in the book where one of the miners, this Bolivian man, Carlos Mamani, said, I didn't want to write my goodbye letter, but I can hear them in the dark saying, are you done with the pencil yet? Get it over here. I want to need the pencil. And these men crying, you know? And so there was a sense among many of them that they were not going to get out. And so when it broke through, uh, Jose Enriquez, they'd been praying. He said, Dios existe, God exists, you know? And so they, there was a definite sense of how, they know how lucky they were. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that question. Yes. You mentioned whenever you were talking about these interviews that there were some times when you couldn't really get the men to talk to you or they didn't have much to say. How did you overcome those difficulties or how did you get them to open up to you in these interviews? Well, I think that um, I was very lucky that I had 33 guys, you know, because I found out human memory works in different kinds of ways. There were people who remembered different kinds of details. There were people who remembered really technical stuff. There were people who remembered um, ph physiological stuff who had noticed, who, who wanted to tell me for whatever reason what the shape of their feces was when it came out, when they were starving. Senor, it was like llama pellets. I Googled llama pellets, you know? So, you know, there was that. Um, but more importantly, you know, I think that I, tell, I now teach journalism uh, at the University of Oregon, and I tell my journalism students, like, the most important thing when you're doing an interview is to communicate you are a human being and that you care about the person you're talking to. And so I try to make that part of my persona when I'm interviewing somebody, is that I, I am not here to just treat you as a source of facts. You know, I'm not here to mine you for facts. I'm here to hear your story. And so that, to me, is what I did to win people over and get them to open up to me. Yes. Another question. Hello. Um, thank you so much for uh, the book. I, oh, I did uh, get a chance to read it and was very excited to be able to read such a great literary work. Oh, um, I do wonder if you've been in contact with the men since you've written the book and if you can tell us about, I would imagine this is like a process of grief that they've gone through, um, grieving that they almost died. And, yes. Uh, where are they at now in that process? Well, most of them are back at work at jobs above ground. A few have at different times gone underground, but it's been a very difficult process for them. Um, I think that um, they now are, are very relieved that the story is coming out. I was at a press junket with Mario Sepulveda, and he said, we are very uh, happy that this movie and this book are coming out now because we hope it gives us our dignity back in Chile. Because in Chile, they have been treated like reality stars. They're like these ordinary guys who got trapped in a mine and now think they're rich and famous and, you know, we're supposed to care about them. So Chileans have this sort of minor fatigue. And so the men are hoping that the book and the movie will have people see exactly what they suffered and what they went through. Um, and so, and I was very pleased. Uh, they asked Mario, what did you think of the film and the book? And he made, said some nice words about the film and then he said about the book, and, you know, the, and the book, let me just tell you, 75% of the things that happened to us are in that book. So I thought that was pretty good. Mm. Um, I think I have time for one last question, so I'll make this the last question. Thank you. Um, I'm starting to get post-traumatic stress from listening to this. But, oh, I'm sorry. But <laughs> that that's what my question's about. Um, you know, I thought that there might be a comparison between the kind of work these guys did and what uh, soldiers do. And I thought, um, geez, 15 days of that 
would be enough to, to leave you with a, a nightmare. And then the rest of the time not being that sure of what, what would happen to you. So I'm wondering about what kind of, uh, you know, aftermath in the way of stress, what we call post-traumatic stress syndrome, there, there is and what kind of help they got. Well, they got a lot of help in the first few weeks. They, um, had, they went, many of them went to group therapy sessions. One of the miners told me, uh, you know, when they were all in a room together, uh, someone tried to close the door and he, they, everybody freaked out. Don't close the door, you know, because for them that was taking them back. I think, uh, unfortunately, in the long term, in the year that followed, um, there was the sense that they were wealthy and rich, they were gonna get wealthy and rich, which they did not. If you read the book, you'll see why that is. And, um, and so um, there really wasn't a, a, an effort, a, a medical intervention, a, a, an intervention, a mental health intervention that was as bold as the rescue had been. So they, re you know, these men set a record for being buried underground, 69, they're in the Guinness Book of World Records. And no, you know, to be trapped in the dark in 90 degree temperatures, 90% humidity. If you buy the paperback, there's pictures and you can see they're shirtless because it's so hot. To be trapped in the heat for 10 weeks in the dark, um, it was a very traumatic thing. The mountain is rumbling. So I think that they suffered a tremendous amount of uh, pain because of that. And I think the men would agree that the government dropped the ball. Many of them have, are now having, are still, I ran into Carlos Barrios in LA for the film thing and he said, I just recently, I was doing fine until like about two months ago. So I think that um, it's, it's an event that really needs to be studied. And the government, uh, there's a new government in place that it has upped the pension that they gave the men. Um, but really I think that, um, I hope that the book uh, brings to light in Chile the depths of the experience, the, tr the depths of the trauma, and of the strength that the men needed to, to get out. So thank you so much for the question. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.